Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode of the show, we speak to McKinley Andrews about neurogenic dysphagia from a speech therapist perspective. McKinley Andrews, uh, welcome to the show. We're really, really glad to have you on board. Uh, thanks very much for doing this. Hi, thank you so much for interviewing me today. It's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's it's exciting for us as well, because whenever I look at the topics, you know, it's always like really weird sometimes. And so we're talking about neurogenic dysphagia. <laughs> And I'm going to let you do the honors of explaining what that is in a few secs. But uh, always the other interesting thing is learning about how you actually found out about us. So I normally ask Shaz, you know, because she does the scheduling, how, how, how did you guys actually meet? Uh, well, I uh, heard, through, uh, heard from a colleague through word of mouth. Um, I was looking for a billing system and when starting my own practice and a uh, good colleague of mine recommended SME Matrix. So uh, yeah, and through that platform, got introduced to the CPD activity and events. So yeah, it was all through word of mouth. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. Thanks, Jess, for doing that as well. I mean, I think we always use those opportunities to, sh to schedule some really cool guests. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this topic as well. Um, so neurogenic dysphagia. Can you break that down for us? What is it and you know, like wh what actually got you started um, and working with patients around this? Right, well, it's quite a big question. Um, I, yeah, speech therapy, we involve with a lot of different populations and um, areas of communication and swallowing difficulties. And this happens to be one which took my interest and I worked with uh, the past six years mainly um yeah so i'll start with just dysphagia on its own um dis meaning difficulty or problem with and the greek word phasia meaning eating so overall dysphagia is a difficulty with any activity that requires you to swallow which includes eating as well as drinking swallowing pills or even swallowing your own saliva um and anything you swallow is called a bolus. So from, from now on, I will refer to it as a bolus. It's just much easier. So let's talk about the swallowing tract. The swallowing tract extends from your desire or anticipation to eat or drink something to the moment the bolus enters your mouth or the oral cavity. And it continues down your throat, or as we call it, the pharynx, and into your food pipe or esophagus. Um, and these are the main areas a speech therapist will work with. And then, of course, um, the bolus will continue down to the stomach, the intestine, and the bowel. So any problems along this tract can cause a swallowing difficulty. And we generally break up the swallowing tract into three phases, your oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. But really, these three um, phases really work quite quickly together in unison. Um, it's a very, very fast uh, phenomenon. As you swallow something, it goes down very quickly. Um, so swallowing involves two main um, components. One is the safety of your swallow. So we look at when there is a problem with swallowing, um, one can potentially start to choke or as we call it, aspirate when um, Anything, any bolus you swallow that is not air enters your lungs, and that is the phenomenon of aspirating. Um, as soon as there is food or liquid or saliva in your lungs, you are at high risk of developing a pneumonia or a chest infection. This requires antibiotics and sometimes even hospital admission. And if you are an elderly person, you can even pass away from a pneumonia. So... Coughing, when one coughs, it is usually a sign that, that something is going close to the airway or is even entering the airway. So this is always a big warning sign if the patient is coughing. Sometimes we have a small percentage of patients who uh, they will have a bolus going into their lungs or airway, but they won't cough. And that is called silent aspiration, which is really quite dangerous 
because it can look like someone is eating and drinking just fine without coughing, but actually it's going into the airway. Um, and we often, yeah, we see about 10 to 30% of our stroke patients uh, will have silent aspiration. Um, and then the second component of swallowing management is sufficient swallowing. So yes, they can swallow safely, but is it enough to sustain their nutrition and hydration for optimal bodily functioning. So if you're not able to get in enough water, for example, this can cause other complications like urinary and kidney problems, fatigue, confusion, dry mouth and throat and thirst, which is obviously discomfort and even seizures and more serious bodily harm. When you have a lack of nutrition, especially in the elderly, this may result in generalized weakness, muscle weakness, decreased bone mass, an increased risk of falling, hospital admission, and longer recovery times. So wounds don't heal as well with lack of nutrition, as well as a weakened immune system. So <clears throat> safe and sufficient swallowing is really, really important for um, good health and uh, prevention of a chest infection. And then when it comes down to neurogenic dysphagia, this is a swallowing difficulty that is caused specifically by a neurological deterioration or injury in the body's nervous system, which involves the brain and the nerves. And I'll be speaking mainly about adults today. Um, so for example, when an adult has a stroke, there is injury or damage to a certain area of brain and the associated nerves. Um, so this is neurological. And commonly these nerves innovate or control the oral, pharyngeal or esophageal muscles and functioning. So that is in a nutshell <laughs> what neurogenic dysphagia is. So <laughs> it's quite a large nutshell there. Um, and so, just on the concept of neurogenic, we're talking this is something that's happening within the brain. So what would be some of the causes of a neurogenic dysphagia? Some causes, or there are a variety of causes. Um, yeah, so mainly damage to the brain and nerves result in the disruption of the muscle sensations or sensation or movement. And this is what causes the dysphagia. So Depending on the area where the injury is neurologically, it will depend on which muscles are affected um, and how they are affected. So um, it can be caused by a stroke, like I mentioned, and we see a high prevalence of dysphagia uh, in strokes, as well as in traumatic brain injuries. So maybe from a car accident or a panga to the head, obviously you have your injury. Uh, it can also be a degenerative neuromuscular condition, such as motor neuron disease. Um, I think we all remember our rugby player, Joost van der Westhuizen, sadly passed away from motor neuron disease. This is where the nerve cells in the brain start to die, um, and thus the muscles don't get the message to move, and with no movement, you get weakness. So um, as soon as your mouth or uh, throat muscles are weak, you, you can start to choke. Other examples of degenerative diseases are multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, which are also, again, breakdown of the nerves communicating with the muscles. And then dementia is another kind of degenerative condition that typically occurs in older adults. Um, it's, this is the damage or loss of nerve cells in the brain which again results in loss of connections at the nerves and the muscles. It causes a loss of mental functions. So memory and thinking skills, judgment. Um, in some cases, these patients can also develop dysphagia because of a deterioration in their mental function. So let's say you have a patient with de dementia, they, they might not want to eat at all. They might forget that they, well, and they might think they have had, they've eaten already and then they refuse to eat. Um, or they might only eat small amounts. This leads to other complications like malnutrition and dehydration, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and then the other side of the coin is that they can also start to choke. 
Um, they might forget that they're chewing and then choke on what they were chewing. They might not be aware of the meal at all. Um, their muscles might also start to get weaker and then we might have to start changing the consistency of their food. So progress uh, going back from chewing a piece of steak to a pureed smooth soup diet, for example. Um, or we might even have to look at their liquids. Liquids run very fast down the throat. And as soon as you are distracted or not concentrating or even have muscle weakness, um, they can choke on liquids and we might have to thicken their liquids so that they run a bit slower. Um, and then the, the more common types of dementias are Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease as well as vascular dementia, some of the common ones that we see. Yeah, so um, th that's just adults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, as she has said earlier, I mean, that sounds, yeah, it's actually quite a lot of info. Um, and I have to ask, I mean, so, because it sounds very complicated, I mean, like, but this is like a lot more inpatient care, like in hospital under like ICU type conditions rather than outpatient. I mean, I suppose stroke could be managed outside, but do you see most of your clients within the hospital kind of setting? Yes, so uh, yes, it definitely. Um, you know, once they are stable to a point where they <clears throat> don't need a feeding tube or they can, you know, take in some or other consistency safely enough to sustain their, their health, um, they can get discharged home and therapy can continue from there, work, working on strengthening muscles, pro maybe progressing from a puree diet <clears throat> to a soft diet or a full diet, progressing from thickened liquids to thin liquids again. So yes, but definitely starts in hospital, in ICU, um, for acute events like your strokes and head injuries, um, <clears throat> and then yeah, your degenerative condition. Sometimes they will go for a checkup with a geriatrician or their neurologist, and they'll say, okay, we recommend a speech therapist. Let's make you an outpatient appointment so that it, you know, it doesn't reach a level where it gets too bad and you start choking. Let's prevent it earlier from happening. So in hospital <clears throat> and out of hospital, that would mean that Oftentimes, you may actually be treating somebody who has got neurogenic dysphagia who might also have a trachea. So you need to check how their swallowing is, obviously, before they can remove that tracheotomy. But because it's coming neurologically, how do you actually diagnose that somebody's got a neurogenic dysphagia when they're in hospital and unable to respond to you? Well, yeah, that is a good question. Um, so there are ways of, so to diagnose dysphagia, of, um, dysphagia is a symptom of another disease or condition. So you need, first need a doctor to diagnose that underlying initial problem or disease. Um, and that patient with a trachea might have had a stroke or head injury, um, or yeah, even, um, thinking of other things that aren't neurological but yeah so you know as you what we do an objective swallowing assessment with them where so usually without a trachea we will do a bedside evaluation we will get them to sit up in the bed or the chair and have them ask them to swallow some water or eat some yogurt chew a banana um, and we look at the oral phase is there food falling out the mouth um, is it getting stuck in the cheeks? Uh, is After they've swallowed, is all the food still in their mouth? So maybe their tongue isn't moving backwards well enough. There's not enough strength. Or well, they can't seal their lips properly to build up that pressure in the mouth to send the bolus backwards. Um, so we look at yeah, the oral phase. Does it take them a long time to chew? And then <clears throat> at the level of the throat, when we're assessing the pharyngeal phase, if they don't have a trachea, uh, we will listen out for coughing, gurgly voice. Um, do they cough upon swallowing or after the swallow? Could there be some residue building up in the throat that doesn't go down well? Um, and then we, if there's a trachea, we actually make the bolus that they swallow blue with food coloring. 
Um, and the reason we choose blue is that there's no other, there's nothing in the body that is blue naturally. Um, so we steer steer clear from greens and yellows. There used to be a green green dye jelly test, but now it's moved on to the blue blue dye test. And um, so we mix we mix the water with blue dye, or we mix it into the yogurt, and we ask them to eat it and swallow it. And then we suction. We ask the nurse to suction from the trachea. And that trachea obviously goes straight into the airway to inflate the lungs. So if we have any blue suction from the airway, from the trachea, then we know it's gone down the wrong pipe and that patient has aspirated. Um, if there's no blue, that is a good sign that successfully all gone down to the stomach and nothing's gone into the lungs. So that is a, a nice objective assessment. Um, uh, yeah. It, because when we just do the bedside evaluation, you, you don't have x-ray eyes, you can't see what's happening in the throat. As I spoke about the silent aspiration, you, you sometimes just don't know. So there is more clinical judgment uh, at a bedside evaluation than the more objective assessments, such as the blue dye tests with trachea. And then you can also do swallow x-rays, which are more objective. Yeah, you know, I love I love how complicated it is. Eh? I mean, I, it yeah. must be <laughs> it must be amazing, like working through that. You know, obviously, you know, without the human emotion around it. But it's um, mm -hmm. I think we had Kerry Cool on, and you know, uh, Shaz was just talking about the trachea now, and I learned tons from there. You know, like because she was talking about the trachea and you know, like how complicated it is, and she mentioned the blue dye test as well. Um, oh, so okay. yeah, so which is pretty interesting, you know, to know that. Uh, but that whole problem but, diagnosis stuff, sorry? Was she a speech therapist as yeah. well? Or? Speech yeah, speech therapist okay. and audiologist, yeah. Um, she was based in the UK and then got back to South Africa. And I think she's back in the UK for a short term, short, short time now. But she was just talking, you know, it's a definitely <laughs> ICU type conditions. Um, but so far in the, con you know, in the conversation, you mentioned stroke a few times. I don't think she did uh, that. And okay. I don't know if that's just the neurogenic stuff. But she did definitely mention you know, the facts about how the trachea yeah. works and stuff like that. Yeah. We, we even saw a lot of uh, COVID patients on, on trachees as well the last couple of years. And even patients with heart conditions who are very weak. Um, yeah, so it varies. Mm. Yeah, and as I was, you know, as we were doing that interview, I was like thinking, uh, what does the speech therapist have to do with, you know, like swallowing and all of those things? And I mean, she, you know, very kindly told us, you know, it's like from the, like down, you know, that's where the speech therapist kind of functions. And I thought that's actually a really cool, cool way to explain it, you know, um, because whenever I think speech therapist, you know, I'm thinking speaking and, you know, communication was a big thing we kind of figured out with speech therapists, because it's not all about just talking, it's about communicating. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was very, very cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what, what I'm getting a sense of as well is that from a, you know, like from a, from an assistance point of view, you know, like, I think there's, there's multiple professionals, you know, that can help someone with that. You know, I've seen a few, you know, from a family point of view, I've seen a few, mm -hmm. you know, stroke cases. And it's quite sad, you know, when someone goes through that. And like, for me, you know, it must be quite... Yeah, it must be quite unnerving, you know, like going through that, not being able to eat properly, not being able to speak properly. But it's really cool, you know, like that we can have professionals like yourself, you know, that can help us with that stuff. Yeah, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like you say, eating and drinking is is an, a privilege. Um, and you, I think it's not until you lose that ability that you realize and it's not just for sustenance and to keep you alive. It's eating and drinking as a sociable event. You eat with your family at dinner. You go out for a coffee with someone. Um, you know, it's a huge part of your life and your mental well-being. Um, you know, to be able to taste and enjoy and just quench your thirst. Um, so dysphagia really is a disability and it can adversely affect your functioning within your community. So yeah, helping these people is really important and very rewarding for us. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I love that you mentioned 
the other aspects of it, that yes, dysphagia is a disability, but more importantly, just how not having that ability to drink or swallow plays a role in other aspects of a person's life. So as a speech therapist treating a patient with dysphagia, I understand 100% in the hospital that you've got the doctor, the surgeon, and anybody else there. But do you also work with part of a multidisciplinary allied healthcare group? You know, is there an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist that also gets involved to try and help the person's swallowing function get improve? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, like I mentioned, okay, the doctors are, are first and foremost, they're the leader of the management team, of the whole team. They diagnose the problem. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, a dietitian will help say, um, say my patient is choking and they need a feeding tube in their nose, temporary feeding tube. Um, the dietitian will be the one to manage that they get safe um, and sufficient nutrition. And, um, you know, even if the patient is eating orally on a, on a puree diet or soft diet, the dietitian will be the one to say, see, okay, are they eating enough? Are they drinking enough? Um, so they are a very important um, part of the patient's management and we species and dietitians work quite closely together, especially in the ICU setting. The chest physios are so great to work with. They are they always give me clues. Okay, is the chest getting worse? Uh, is it improving? Is it is it sounding like a different lung condition versus an aspiration lung condition? They, so they're really, really in tune, especially with tracky work. They are so great as well. Um, so yeah, especially with breathing exercises. So that is, they're really great. And then the physios and the occupational therapists how great just for building um, strength in other parts of the body. So, you know, the, the shoulder and chest area is what supports your head and neck area. So as soon as you have weakness here or even down um, at, the, at the base of your trunk, your hip area, as soon as you lose stability and control down at the hips already, you lose control up here and less stability here. So, you know, everything's connected. Um, physios and OTs are wonderful at building up that strength and support, as well as, um, you know, in helping the feeding process again, feeding yourself, lifting up the arm with a, with a, weak, with a weak arm, especially in a stroke or a head injury. Um, yeah, and uh, the radiologists as well are really helpful in helping to diagnose what's going wrong at when we look at the swallow x-rays. And we look at what level, okay, the pharyngeal phase, the oral phase, you know, if, if the food's not getting pushed down in the esophageal phase, is it because of a narrowing? Is there a stricture? Is there a pocket that's developed, that food's pocketing in there, not getting down to the stomach? So, um, yeah, and then, of course, identifying any aspiration when it's going into the lungs. So, um, full dis multidisciplinary team is, is the most optimal management you could have for a neurogenic dysphagia patient. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, having <laughs> having a team like that around you. I didn't hear you mention psychologists. The last time when I was speaking to Kerry, I forgot the OT. You definitely mentioned OT. <laughs> but, <laughs> but is a psychologist I, I, part of that too? I apologize greatly to the neuropsychologists out there. They okay. are definitely part of the team. And I do think that, yes, they are often forgotten about. Mm. Um, just the, the change that this patient is going through. They were, you know, perhaps in a stroke patient, they were fully independent like you and I. Um, and now they wake up, they can't dress themselves, they can't feed themselves, they can't speak properly. Um, you know, that um, maybe they are milk per mouth and now they can't, you know, join their family for meals. And just going through that change is, is drastic. And we see a lot of our patients going into depression and just don't want to participate in therapy. Sometimes they've given up. So, and, and I can understand from where they come, from where they're coming from. And of course, the rest of us in the team will always try and motivate them and put ourselves in their shoes. But I think the neuropsychologist is the, the best one, the most trained to deal with that side of the recovery. Yeah. 
and so, even um, even talking with their family as well, not just not just the patient. So just carrying on on the trail of somebody who has had a stroke and that kind of thing. Um, so my father recently had a series of strokes, and it was really interesting to see how. You know, you always know the physical symptoms, you know, the, the lymph on the one side and that kind of thing, but just how involved that he is now with his speech therapist. And it's not just about the talking. So coming back to dysphagia, I find that the more tired my dad is, the more difficulty he has in swallowing. Is that a common, you know, common side effect of somebody having had a stroke? I mean, now, in the morning, he's got no problem having his breakfast, but here by six in the evening, you know, he starts eating a lot slower and a lot more. And he says it's just because he struggles to swallow. Is that or a symptom of dysphagia? Yes, yes, it definitely can be. So muscle fatigue, um, you know, muscle weakness is one of the main um, fallouts after a stroke. And it can be anywhere in the head and neck area or the, or the limbs. So you might find if his swallowing gets a bit fatigued by the end of the day, you might find that his speech might not be as intelligible as the morning. Or it might be that in the morning he just has porridge, which is nice and sloppy and easy to swallow. Maybe for dinner he's having harder things to chew, like chicken or steak or whatever else, maybe bread. So also look at what he's eating. That makes a big difference. Um, if he had a soup in the evening, for example, that might help with his muscle fatigue um, to get it down a bit quicker and easier and hopefully no choking. Yeah, but definitely we see a marked difference in, or we call it just arthria, when the muscles are weak um, from the stroke and the speech is slurred or soft or slow. Um, and usually they are better in the mornings than in the afternoons, or even they're better at the beginning of the conversation versus the end of the conversation, depending on their severity. But yeah, that is common in strokes. Hmm. I like how mm -hmm. you broke that down. That was a really good question from Shaz as well. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to take well, it back. Yeah, sorry, Shaz, that sorry. your dad did have all these strokes. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> Hey, he's getting along a lot better now. So, you know, it's just one of those curiosity things of, you know, is this a continuation symptom? Um, so, you know, it's easier for me to discuss it and then say to my mom, you need to actually, when he sees his speech therapist, just maybe bring this back up with her. Um, but it's also good to know that it is normal and it makes sense that if you're tired after the end of the day, that everything in this area has got muscle fatigue. So it is going to slow down a little bit, pay a little bit more attention. And you're right about the conversation as well, bright and chirpy in the morning and you can hear everything, but if it's a long <laughs> conversation, and you know, I picked that up with a couple of other people that I've met that have had strokes, is that you can try and keep the conversation short because the longer it is, the more difficult it becomes for them to get across what they're trying to say because everything's getting tired now. Yes. Well, if you think about it, your whole body is made of muscles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can affect any, any part of your body. Um, yeah, and it's not only weakness. The muscles don't only get affected by weakness. The muscles might get affected by lack of sensation as well. So if you can't feel your tongue or the left cheek, in your mouth you won't know if there's food sitting in there or if there's food left on your tongue or even sitting in your throat so the sensation of the muscles is also very important I know like for the OTs for example if you have a hand that can't feel anything they warn the patient of careful not to burn yourself feel the hot water with your good hand first and then you know you can get into the bath so mm. sensation is a big issue and and also um control so um a motor planning activity so sometimes um if you know the muscles are when you chew you there's a motor pattern that your, your brain knows but if you have a motor planning fallout you, you can't chew properly or your brain isn't telling your jaw what to do 
properly. The message is inter has been interfered with. So there's different ways a muscle can be affected. And that also depends on where in the brain you know, your injury has happened. Mm. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, like, you know, when we talk about these really, um, I want to say obscure, but in your world, I mean, this is normal, uh, as in you see a lot more of those patients. But in, you know, in my world, you know, this is like completely a foreign concept. But it's, you know, it must be, it's always interesting how the body is, you know, like you, you take, you know, I said the same thing to Kerry as well, because I said, you know, like, you don't take like swallowing, you know, like as a, you know, you take it for granted, you know, like, that's just what you oh, do yeah. until you can't. And then it's amazing how complicated it becomes, you know, even having a, a fever as an example, you know, it's like such a simple thing, you know, just one or two degrees, you know, even less than that. And then the whole body is out of whack. It yeah. never ceases to amaze me, you know, how that kind of links up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just thinking of fevers, you know, if you have a dementia, a patient with dementia who has a urinary tract infection or sepsis somewhere in the body, um, you know, they, they, their rhythm completely goes out of whack. They're way more confused and suddenly they start to choke um, often well not in all patients but depends on the patient but a fever can really set back a, a neuro someone with a neuro uh, injury you know, I've had stroke patients who you know initially in their recovery they've been choking or battling to swallow and then they progress and they get better and they go home and then they come back with an infection and they are choking again so it can bring out those old deep set neurological injuries, which is quite, quite amazing. It's really interesting. <laughs> mm. No, definitely. And uh, I, I do want to go back to maybe the beginning a little bit and just ask, I mean, how did you even get into this area of interest? Like, you know, it's not like, I'm, I'm assuming not at, at university while you were studying. I mean, I'm assuming at some point, you know, you kind of cross paths somewhere and then you kind of went down that route and said, this is pretty interesting. How, can you take us through that? So what I'm trying to get is how, how would a speech therapist, you know, try to follow, you know, your path and say, I actually want to specialize in this. Well, um, yes. Well, the speech, the four year speech therapy degree um, actually includes dysphagia training, which I didn't know when I went into it. I thought it was all about communication, but so you get your, your training um, at, at university and, you know, after you graduate, you are licensed to work, assess with, manage um, dysphagia patients from, from neonates to geriatrics. Um, obviously, you know, it's a basic training. If you, the more knowledge and experience you have, the better. Um, yeah, and I think just through, you know, working with different clientele, you will get to see, okay, what you're more interested in, um, which patients you really enjoy. Um, yeah, and then I was lucky enough to be employed by a private practice the last six years where I got to work with these patients. I knew from a while ago that I was interested in adult neurogenic dysphagia when, so I did my master's in how speech therapists in South Africa assess a strokes, stroke patient swallowing at the bedside. What are we doing? Is the consistency in our practice? Um, so I was really interested in it from when I learned about it at varsity. Um, and yeah, I think if you can get a job where you are, where you work with a lot of these patients, your interests just skyrockets and you 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 want to learn more about it you can do courses in it um they are what was i going to say <laughs> um yeah like in the icu my interest in trackies really really peaked so i found myself you know learning a lot from the chest physios from the pulmonologists um i i looked online for information um i still would love to do some courses so yeah I think just the interest for me led me in this direction and I was lucky enough to get the right job where I was working in the ICUs which was just my my, my ideal job 
<laughs> and doing my masters was great as well. Mm. Um, hard work, but so interesting. And yeah. Mm, yeah, well done for that. So PhD on the horizon as well? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Too much work. <laughs> yeah, I figure from the masters there must have been quite a lot of work. I mean, uh, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't hear of many speech therapists with a masters, or maybe it's just you know I haven't asked the question. But I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. I actually didn't no, know that dysphagia. Lots, lots of us with masters, definitely. Ah, okay, cool. Okay, but yeah. but it's not necessary. Hey, eh? I mean, like it's definitely no. okay. Like I say, you once you finish your degree, you are licensed and trained to to manage dysphagia, yeah. Mm, okay, cool, no, that's very cool. I didn't know that. And I like what you said, you know, like in terms of how do you, you know, like how, you know, like finding a job in that area of interest obviously just makes you more of an expert and a specialist uh, in terms of that. And you mentioned the courses, so I'm assuming, you know, there's courses around that stuff and any tools or anything like that? I mean, is, is there any like special things that you need? Uh, you mentioned the, the blue dye stuff, uh, but any mm -hmm. other, like a special toolkit that speech therapists have that, that no. works with this. <laughs> yeah, some, some speeches have a, a dysphagia kit where you'd have your blue dye, you'd have some gloves, a tongue depressor, some yogurt, <laughs> maybe if you could get some ice from somewhere, straws, syringes, um, definitely uh, lappies or paper towels for mess. Um, yeah, there's a whole range of things you need. Um, spoon, knife and fork. Um, yeah, in terms of course, uh, other tools, there are like there's a South Africa dysphagia screener, which even the nurses can use, um, you know, when there's not a speech therapist present or when they want to see if there's a need for a referral to a speech therapist. So there are some lovely screeners that one can use. So basically a list of things to look out for, coughing, drool, gurgly voice, things like that. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's an amazing speech therapist who's very well known in our speechy community who is the dysphagia guru. He is Prof. Mershon Pillay. He's, um, I think he's now moved out to New Zealand, but he was at UKZN and Stellenbosch for a while, mm -hmm. or was it UPP? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky enough to have him as my supervisor for my master's. Oh. And basically, if there's any problem with the dysphagia management or any tricky patient, we all go to immersion and ask him for help <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah we were one of the sponsors yeah we were one of the sponsors at the i think the speech conference that was last year and i remember he was one of the keynote speakers um, I wonder it was virtual wasn't it uh, i'm not sure if you were there but uh yeah no. you were one of them and um yeah so i remember seeing his name and yeah, and, uh, you know, hearing some of what he was talking about. It didn't make any sense to me, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, but, as, he, was but part of, um, he was part of an international team that put together um, an international dysphagia diet guideline. So if I say to you, okay, this patient must be on a soft diet, you know, everyone's version of a soft diet is different. So they put together guidelines, okay, this is a soft diet, this is a puree diet, this is a full diet. So he was um, yeah, really, really well known for putting that together and now implementing it at different hospitals and care facilities is, is the goal <laughs> around mm. the world. Okay, yeah. well, no, that's that's yeah. actually amazing. But well, putting mm. putting that whole story together, that's that's pretty amazing. And I think the fact that you got him as a supervisor as well keeps that close, you know, like that um, that network, you know, that if you it's ever really needed cool. it, pretty cool. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> in terms of complications, you know, that a patient probably could go through in terms in terms of neurogenic dysphagia, is there anything that kind of springs to mind? Uh, yeah, well. The the biggest one and most in, the worst one is the choking aspiration and developing a, a lung infection. That is our worst case scenario complication. Um, and of course, like I said, you know, it can lead to death and 
you know, it might even require ventilation. So the, they might sedate the patient, put tubes down their throat into their lungs to, to keep them ventilated until the chest gets better. So that's really the greatest complication. We do want, you know, sometimes when a patient is palliative, um, they have a degenerative swallow condition, they're not going to get better. Um, they continue to choke on everything that they swallow. You're ultimately going to either need to be ventilated or let the patient go in the most comfortable way possible. Um, yeah, depends on whether that patient has a tube feed or not. Um, there, you know, there's different opinions on tube feeds, especially from the family's point of view, if they are the patient's main decision maker. Um, yeah, so that is, you know, ventilation, pneumonia and death are one of the, the, the worst complications. Um, then, of course, discomfort. Yeah, choking is a terrible sensation and feeling. Um, it can be quite traumatic. Um, I think with some children choke, as, uh, yeah, when children choke at a young age, they have this memory of choking on a fish bone or something, and then, you know, they avoid fish <laughs> or things like that. It can be very traumatic. Um, and even if a patient is palliative again, that choking sensation is, is not, it's not, doesn't fit into palliation. So if, a, you know, if you're not going to go the, pay, the feeding tube route, do you want this person to experience that choking sensation every mouthful they get? It's, it's horrible. And it, it doesn't fit in with giving the patient comfort and the, and the last time of their lives. So, um, that is another complication, one which, yeah, can, can cause some ethical dilemmas sometimes. I'm going now into palliation quite a bit, but um, the, a globus feeling that is like, if you feel like something is stuck in your throat and it's just sitting there, that can um, be quite uncomfortable and worrying. Um, and then, yeah, what else? Um, other complications, I think I mentioned before, dehydration or malnutrition, um, the mental health side of it, where one might develop depression and feel socially isolated. Um, yeah, and then yeah, things like weight loss, uh, thirst, um, and even sometimes reflux could be a complication of dysphagia. So, um, you know, the, the long-term feeding tubes, we call it a peg, it goes directly into your stomach, a percutaneous endoscopic, what is the G for now? <laughs> I forgot gastro, this. it'll be yeah. gastro something. Yes, yes that's it. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the risks of those surgeries is reflux. So your stomach contents comes up into your softness and into your throat, depends on the severity. It can even reach your airway and then you can choke on it or it can hurt your vocal folds, um, causing a hoarse voice or no voice. Um, constant coughing is also uncomfortable. And, and I think up, up to 70% of patients don't actually feel reflux. Um, and they un they don't know it's happening, um, so that is also a complication. Um, I think if you have a pig, you can also have a, a risk for developing an infection at the wound site, where you have to keep it clean every day um, and prevent infection. So, yeah, there are a few risks depending on the patient and where they are in their journey, and um, yeah, what sort of food they're eating so gastrostomy that was it <laughs> <laughs> well then for remembering that uh, I, I, all of these acronyms i mean per practitioner it must be amazing you know like putting that together i'm sure there must be a glossary or something you can refer to like a special yeah. book <laughs> uh, that would be quite cool to put together actually um and with this condition um mckinley can it be cured i mean is it a 
is it a permanent thing or is it i mean once someone presents with new, neurogenic dysphagia is i mean is the prognosis good or bad i think it depends a lot on your main condition from which it's stemming from um so you know our acute strokes have a lot of potential to improve um, as the brain heals um, and with therapy by stimulating muscles, stimulating nerves with even physio and OT um, with our exercises, um, there is a lot of potential to improve. Uh, we see it's about 50% of our stroke patients will have dysphagia. And I think about 10% of those will go on to have dysphagia longer than six months. So you know, six months, it's a slow recovery. Every patient's different, depends on the severity of their stroke, how much damage has happened in the brain, where in the brain has the damage occurred. And um, yeah, so with, with therapy and time, there is great potential for improvement. And everyone's goals are different as well. Um, you might not, your goal might not to be progressing back to a full diet it depends depends on on the person um yeah so then you get your your degenerative conditions as i mentioned they they can't be cured but they can be managed i think sometimes certain medications can help a lot um like parkinson's patients they get just thinking of the medication Carbilev, um, if taken half an hour before the meal, their muscle functioning improves greatly and their swallowing performance gets much better. Um, so yes, it can be managed, um, but often you see the swallow function deteriorate and then you just have to prevent aspiration as much as possible and look at what consistency you can get in in large amounts at safety. Um, yeah. Um, otherwise, just thinking of what else. Yeah, I know that's that's depends on the condition how how it can be cured or get better or worse. So it really is it, it, it's a mixed bag when it comes to dysphagia. It, it depends on the neurogenic condition. If this was a head injury that there could be a recovery from, the, the dysphagia could improve, but if it is a degenerative illness like your multiple sclerosis, your motor neurons and Parkinson's, the chances are it's going to get progressively worse. As a speech therapist, how would you advise the family of a patient with something like MS or motor neuron syndrome, or that kind of thing that as much as we can help with swallowing now, this is going to get progressively worse over time. And how would they be able to just help or monitor their loved one or family member? Yeah, well, we will always make the patient, if they are cognitively intact, um, we'll always make the patient aware of these things as well. Um, yeah, well, we will start out by talking about the condition and its nature and how it re regresses. Um, and we will tell them about signs and symptoms to look out for. Um, you know, if, if they do get that uh, urinary tract infection, okay, that's when you're gonna look out for more choking or if they're sleepier than usual, or if suddenly what they usually can eat well, suddenly starts to become difficult or longer to chew or if anything is slower or longer or more unsafe yeah just to to watch out for those foods um or liquids and then we also have a general list of high risk foods so foods that are notorious for getting for getting choked on more than others so for example long stringy foods like spinach or gem squash or Bitty foods like mints or like a dry scrambled egg, those little bits get everywhere, can get stuck in the throat quite easily. Things like pips and skins can stick in places. Um, even bread, bread can require a lot of muscle strength to chew and push down in the throat. 
So we, we go over those high risk foods that's just to watch out for. Um, doesn't mean they can't eat them, but if they start to struggle, then just avoid them. Um, yeah, and you can, there are ways around it. Like if you really want to eat your mints, you could mix it into a mashed potato, which will keep the bits stuck together to making it more cohesive. So it will pass down the throat in one as opposed to bits everywhere. So there are ways of getting around things sometimes that become a problem. Um, but yeah, once again, you can also refer to the neuropsychologist to help with counseling and just to prepare the family for what to expect. Um, yeah, and the neurologist as well um, can also help with that education. Um, otherwise, yeah, giving handouts of information for them to take home, leaving them lots of opportunity to ask questions, um, the family and the patient themselves. And then also, again, I think, look at what the patient's goals are, you know, um, what for them is most important. If they have a favorite food or um, a desire to taste a specific thing, then, yeah, we look at their goals as well. You mentioned, um, uh, McKinley, you mentioned like uh, dementia like a few times, you know, like so. Uh, do you find much issues with patients with dementia? I mean, we had a family gathering this weekend and, you know, someone was talking about like a relative with dementia. And it sounds quite sad, you know, like, I mean, the person doesn't recognize like even family members. I mean, but I can't see someone like that being compliant, you know, to stuff and remembering all of those things. Is there any, anything around that that you find? Yeah, dementia is, is very sad because, you know, the patient isn't aware, always aware of what's going on, depending on their severity. But, you know, it's hard for the family because, you know, they they still know what's going on. They still love their, their family member. And, um, you know, sometimes there is just no reasoning with a patient with dementia. They, they just can't <laughs> grasp the the reasoning or the the judgment or the um the problem or how to solve it um yeah so it's very very challenging in terms of intake often we see dementia patients who just don't eat enough um and there are some interesting programs i've read about at various care facilities i think more in america where i think uh the parkinson's patient who the can be quite active and shuffle around quite a lot the whole day. And then it's each um, each per, each employee's responsibility to give that person a snack at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m. So there's constant snacking just to get their total intake up for the day, their total um, nutrition in. So there are programs where if you really have a good, um, good program, you can get around that poor intake. Um, but, you know, when the patient's at home, it can be very difficult. And then when it comes to choking, um, you know, if a patient is bed bound, a dementia patient, just having the family know how to position them upright at home, uh, especially so that they don't fall um, and just getting them to eat and drink safely at home. You know, they might need to only feed with a syringe instead of a straw for liquids, for example or just for them to follow all those guidelines at home can be so important. Um, yeah, and then again, looking at the consistency of what they eat is very important, but generally, you, yeah, you can't, you, you kind of have to go with what they're feeling on that day. Um, sometimes you have to be a bit creative and you might, you know, they might think that, Uncle Larry's coming for lunch or something <laughs> and just go with it to make it work. Um, yeah, you sometimes have to make up stories or just go with the stories that they that they think are happening um, because they become very disorientated and they sort of live in their own world. Mm. Um, I think when they start to eat less and less and less, it's, it's their body's way of shutting down as well sometimes. So you can't always force them to eat. Um, mm. You know, some people think of a pig as force feeding and perhaps it is in a way, um, mm. but it will 
the idea of a pig is to maintain life. Um, not necessarily the quality of life though. And yeah, so they are a complex bunch. And I think working with their families closely is very important. Um, if they are their main decision makers, you need to be on board with, um, with their plan and how they view the patient's quality of life. I've had, I've had families where one brother wants to sustain life and put in a pig where the other brother wants to improve quality of life and have the patient eat and drink, even though they're severely aspirating. So it, it's very interesting and multifaceted and you have to take everyone into account. Um, yeah, and look at, you know, other comorbidities, uh, how, who's looking after the patient, who's their power of attorney. It, it can get quite, quite ugly sometimes even where mm. there are conflicting family members. Mm. Uh, um, yeah, I love how you said that and I'm glad that I asked that. I mean, we had uh, a psychologist on, B'nai Otto, um, not uh, Bini, sorry, Bini Otto. And um, you know, like we talked about bereavement and death and stuff like that, but this is a really cool case, you know, where you wanna almost talk about those things before something happens. You know, like, how would you like to be treated? How, what would you like to? And unfortunately, we never have those conversations. You know, it's like the worst conversation ever. And I think, you know, there's definitely a space, you know, for talking to your children or your siblings or, you know, parents maybe even, and saying, you know, like if something happens, you know, this is what I would like. And, you know, whether they take that into consideration or not is something completely different, but at least they know. Whereas I think when someone is in that state, you know, they can't tell you anymore. And I think that's, that's kind of sad. You're spot on. It's a very hard conversation to have, um, and few families have those things to sort of um, a living will almost. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, people often think about the ventilators only and not feeding tubes sometimes. And um, yeah, sometimes that, stuff, that conversation is hard. There's a wonderful book written by a surgeon, um, Atul Gwande. Uh, he wrote a book called Being Mortal, and it's a, it's a wonderful look at uh, the perspective of geriatrics um, and what brings meaning to them and motivation to them. Um, yeah, it, it's very, very interesting. Mm. It makes you think about having that conversation with your parents. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm. No, no, I, I love it. I mean, what was the author again? I would love to link to that. I mean, we're going to give you a link in the show notes. Atul, A-T-U-L. Yeah. One day, G-A-W-A-N-D-E. Okay, cool. Uh, That's yeah. a great read. <laughs> no no definitely i mean I, i'm a big believer in this i mean i think that's one of the reasons we're doing the show is just to almost shed more light on some of those topics that we almost like don't talk about or we don't know about or anything mm -hmm. like that i mean even this has been absolutely amazing um i do want to wrap up now and just ask you though before we do because we try you know our best to kind of put everything together but is there anything that we should have asked you around neurogenic uh, dysphagia that you thought we didn't cover so far um, I think there was perhaps um, I could recommend if you are thinking of working with adult neurogenic dysphagia, I think you need to be okay with things like phlegm and saliva and those things combined with food. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you need a lot of patience for people with disabilities, um, especially with dysphagia. They can be slow going, they can be fussy eaters. Um, yeah, and I think you need to be a people's person. I think you need to have compassion and um, be, be able to empathize with families and patients who have lost their independence or, um, yeah, families and patients who are going through a degenerative process. Um, yeah, so I think before you consider doing those things, uh, doing neurogenic dysphagia, consider those things and see if you are the right fit. 
um, yeah, and I think definitely educate yourself as much as possible. Do your own research. Um, yeah, learn from others. Don't be shy to learn from others and talk to other speech therapists and other uh, allied health professionals and doctors. I learn so much every day from, from other professionals. And um, yeah. That's, I think that's all I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a lot. Uh, I love the words compassion, empathy. I mean, all of those are cool. And I think also what you mentioned, you know, about the, you know, the, I wouldn't say the negative, but, you know, parts of the job, I suppose, you know, being, I, I think anytime you go in clo anywhere close to a hospital setting or definitely ICU, you know, you should almost like prepare your mind, you know, for it's sometimes is not pretty. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think that goes without saying, but thanks for mentioning it because that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, yeah. Shaz, anything on your side that we thought you thought we should have asked McKinley that we didn't? Um, no, I think covered the topic quite nicely. I'm sure there's a lot more that we could discuss on uh, dysphagia and the neurogenic side of it, but I think we got the main points across. And I have to agree there. I love the fact that you did mention that compassion and that empathy and just understanding because from not only the patient's perspective, but from their family perspective, it is a scary situation to be in. And really just having the doctor or the healthcare professional kind of empathize and understand and also explain what's happening is a huge benefit, benefit to the family and the patient. It's more easier to wrap your head around something when you know what's going on than when you're just sitting frightened in ICU. So I love that aspect of compassion, empathy, and understanding. Yes, for sure. <laughs> okay, um, that's a wrap. Thanks, thanks again for doing this. We really, really appreciated you you being on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for chatting to me. It was really, really great. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, stay tuned, and we'll speak to you in the next episode. <laughs>